no problem. Uh, so just I'll uh, kind of briefly introduce myself again. Um, but my name is Corey Folsom O'Keefe, and, and as Jane said, I'm the Bird Conservation Program Manager for Audubon, Connecticut. Um, and in that role, I oversee Audubon, Connecticut's Coastal Bird Program. Uh, I oversee our Important Bird Area Program, which um, identifies areas that pr provide critical habitat for bird species of conservation concern across the state. And then I also uh, oversee our Wildlife Friends Program, which is a youth education program. Um, but I also did my master's degree uh, at Connecticut, Connecticut College, and uh, for that master's degree I studied a shrubland nesting birds. So not quite grassland nesting birds, but uh, birds that are, uh, you know, do utilize uh, young habitat types. Uh, so I do have a bit of a, you know, understanding about uh, birds that use uh, younger types of habitat, so grasses, shrublands, meadows. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, conservation of grass and bird species and, and how that relates to farming. Uh, but I do want to just start by saying a little bit about Audubon, Connecticut. You can advance the slide. So Audubon, Connecticut is uh, one of Connecticut's most influential bird conservation organizations. Uh, through habitat management, policy, research, and education, we're working to protect bird species of conservation concern across the state. Yeah. Uh, we're also a partner addressing a wide range of environmental and human health uh, concerns. And I really think the most important word there is partner because it's by working together with uh, other organizations, with other people, with landowners, that we're able to really make the biggest difference for birds. And we couldn't do the work that we do on our own. Uh, and we're also a leader setting the course for environmental sustainability in Connecticut. Um, and, you know, sustainability, environmental sustainability, that's kind of like, you know, when you go to a national park and you want to leave no trace. So we want to make sure that, um, you know, our lands, um, our woodlands, our forests, our meadows, our, our farmlands are going to be here for future generations. And then also, uh, things that are good for birds tend to be good for people too. Uh, and that's something we, we firmly believe. Lastly, Audubon, Connecticut is a state office of the National Audubon Society. Um, so. In that, I feel that uh, you know, where the work that we're doing here in Connecticut is also getting replicated uh, in Maine, it's getting replicated in New York, it's getting replicated in Maryland, uh, Florida, uh, and, and across the United States, all the way to California and Alaska. So um, we're able to focus on, on strategies that protect birds throughout their life cycles. Uh, and it really makes um, the work we do um, really be able to make a difference for birds. Now, the National Audubon Society uh, divides their work up into to five strategies. So uh, one is our coastal strategy, which is protecting birds that nest along our shorelines. Uh, another one is our working land strategy, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about in just a minute. We have a water strategy, uh, which is basically protecting you know, water resources in areas where um, you know, water is, 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 uh, is hard to come by. So I think California, where they're always having water shortages. So we do a lot of work in California um, to make sure that birds and people have the water resources they need. Uh, we do work on climate change, um, especially uh, trying to figure out ways to uh, work with our, our, our governments and policymakers to reduce emissions of, of carbon dioxide to hopefully uh, s slow climate change and sea level rise and things like that. And uh, lastly, we have a Bird Friendly Communities Initiative, which is all about um, helping people understand what are the little things they can do in their own backyard that are going to be birds, good for birds and wildlife, and also give people a place where they can get outside and um, just enjoy interacting with nature. Now, our working lands uh, strategy is a strategy that is all about working with farmers, with ranchers, and with forest and forest landowners. Uh, if you add up all the parcels of forests, ranches, and farms, uh, it adds up to roughly a billion acres, or about half of the land in the entire lower 48 states. Um, so if we want to be protecting habitat for birds or, or improving habitat for birds, it's really important that we work with the people who own forests, who own farms, who own ranches. Because um, they are the people who, are, who have the responsibility of, of our nation's birds in their hands. And Audubon really goes about this in two ways. Uh, one is to collaborate with landowners, land managers, government agencies, and private industry uh, to increase the quality of habitat on privately managed lands to benefit um, birds. Uh, we have a set of sort of flagship species that are our working lands flagship species. Uh, so, you know, we, we work with landowners to 
to, to see if they can improve their habitat. Um, and then we also work with landowners uh, and help to help them come up with bird-friendly practices. So ways that they might manage their land um, that are going to have the, you know, be the most beneficial to birds. Uh, so you might think of like, uh, this one might be, you say, working with uh, landowner, say if I was working with a forest, you know, a forest landowner, uh, it might be, say, suggesting that they put in a few cuts on their land uh, to open up canopy gaps that are going to promote habitat for uh, birds that like to be able to use canopy gaps for foraging. Um, so it's going to improve the quality of that, that bit of forest. Uh, then over here, so applying bird friendly management practices. So uh, if there are ways maybe they can strategize about, well, we're going to do a cut in one area this year and then do a cut in another area this year. So coming up with management strategies that are going to be beneficial to birds and to the landowner as well. So primarily today, I want to talk about uh, young habitats. So grasslands and hay fields, meadows, and shrublands. And uh, you know, there are different birds that associate with different types of habitat. So you know, in a forest, you're going to find your, your scarlet tanager and your wood thrush. Uh, in a, along the coast, you're going to get your semi-pollinated sandpipers and piping plovers and uh, snowy owls. This season, we have snowy owls all over the Connecticut coast, which is pretty exciting. Uh, in your grasslands, in hayfields, and meadows, and shrublands, you're going to get a different set of birds. Uh, so uh, birds that you find in grasslands and hayfields are things like the bobolink and the savannah sparrow. Uh, a meadow might be where you find common yellow throats and indigo buntings. And a shrubland field is going to be a place where you have prairie warblers and uh, blooming warblers uh, and uh, other birds that like vegetation that's just a few feet high. Now all of these habitats are actually uh, pretty limited uh, in New England. Uh, so this is just a, a map of you know, New England. You can see New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, um, Massachusetts, the other states. And you can see this light green area that's over here. Those are all open grassland areas. Uh, and click on it one more. I'm actually an airplane pilot as well as, as a biologist. And uh, I fly with the, the Civil Air Patrol, which is the auxiliary of the, the Air Force. It's a volunteer pilot organization. And uh, last uh, fall, I went for a flight from Meriden up to uh, Lake Champlain up here and back again. And one thing that I really could see when I was flying that distance was you could totally see that there's all this grassland, there's all this open farmland in the, the Hudson Valley and across areas of New York. But it's literally, as soon as you get over the Connecticut border, we are predominantly forest. There really is a very limited amount of grassland. You can go to the next slide. And when you look at the land cover uh, uh, you know, mapping that has been done by the University of Connecticut, uh, if you go back to 1985, we had just 8.6% of our, our land cover in Connecticut was agricultural fields. 1.3% uh, of it was sort of other grassland types. And then 0.4% of it was utility right of ways. Uh, and you can sort of see the, the numbers change as we kind of get to the, the more recent years. Um, but between 1985 and 2006, we've actually lost agricultural fields by 1.2%. Um, we've gained a little bit of, of other grass and habitats, and we've lost some utility rights of ways. Uh, when you sum that all up, between 1985 and 2006, we've lost 41.1 square miles of young habitat, uh, whether that's farm fields, hay fields, uh, you know, shrub fields, meadows. Uh, we are, you know, that is a very limited habitat type here in Connecticut. Next slide. The main re one of the really the main reason that we've lost a lot of our open habitat is really just forest succession. Uh, if you go back 100 years, 200 years, uh, Connecticut was mostly open habitat, um, either because of farming um, or because of uh, charcoal production. We really had a lot of open habitat. But uh, slowly but surely, uh, we, uh, forests have sort of regrown in Connecticut. Uh, so where initially we had grasslands, um, you know, farm fields, we really are predominantly forest now. We're about 60% forested. Uh, so again, that open habitat, that young habitat, is really limited. Now, of those young habitat types, I do really want to focus on grasslands today. So grasslands are areas where vegetation is dominated by grasses. Um, however, sedges and rush families can also be found. Um, grasslands occur naturally on all continents except Antarctica. Um, and they're found in almost eco every ecoregion on the earth. 
Now, there are two types of, of grasslands uh, that we typically talk about in Connecticut. There are uh, cool season grasslands, or grasses, that uh, are growing really strong and healthy in the spring and early summer, and then they kind of uh, don't grow as much in the middle of the summer, and then they grow again in the late summer in the, the fall. And then there are warm season grasses, which do the majority of their growing in the summertime. And uh, hay fields are typically cool season grasslands. Uh, so what I'm going to do for the next you know, 15 minutes or so is just focus on uh, hay fields and the cool season uh, grass birds that, that, the birds that use those, those hay fields and other cool season grasslands. Um, one other slide just showing the, the change in the amount of grassland available to, for birds. I, I think this is a, you know, just another slide that shows changes in Connecticut. And you can see that uh, you know, we had upwards of, of 400,000 acres in the early 1900s and are, you know, are down to just, say, about 60,000 acres now across Connecticut. And this slide just shows some of the, the key grassland areas uh, in Connecticut. Uh, when I showed that sort of slide of, uh, of the, all of New England, uh, you can see that there was some grasslands in the, the Hudson Valley. Some of that stretches over into uh, western Connecticut. And then we have a lot of grasslands along the Connecticut River, and then scattered, some scattered about in eastern Connecticut. Next slide. Here's a, a map of Cornwall right here. And I just wanted to point out, you know, sort of looking again at this area, that you know there is some grassland habitat in here. So we have some uh, down here right by the center of Cornwall, and there's a nice patch right up here as well, and some little smatterings uh, throughout this area. And uh, this might be a slide we could go come back to in the end if we want to, but I also pulled up a map of the protected lands in Cornwall um, to see if there was any overlap. I do think that um, some of the preserves that are up in here, preserves and uh, easements, do overlap with this grassland area up here. So, um, you know, the Cornwall Conservation Trust uh, does own some land that is, you know, this sort of grassland, early successional habitat type um, that could be beneficial to, to grassland listing birds. So, um, back to the birds that use hay fields or cool season grasslands. Uh, this is the bobolink. And, uh, this is a you know, chattery little bird. The males look like this. The females are more of a, a brownish color. Um, and my favorite thing about these birds is actually the way they sound and um, their behavior when you see them. So once they come back to Connecticut, oftentimes you'll see them sort of flying over a meadow and then they drop back down into the meadow or into the, the hay field. Um, and their noise is kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's just this crazy jumble of notes. Um, so it is this really distinct, distinct sound. Um, I was working, I was doing a, a forest bird habitat assessment for a landowner maybe like two years ago, and, and I was standing in their backyard and I heard that, <laughs> and I was like, oh my god, there's a bobolink! And sure enough, they had, they had an area in the, the field around their house that they didn't mow, um, and there was a bobolink in the middle of that, that field, so it was pretty cool to see. Um, our next slide. This is the Savannah Sparrow. And uh, uh, these guys are so smaller. Uh, you know, they're a typical little sparrow, but um, they can have a little bit of yellow on their head. And sometimes if they look straight on at you, they have like a star-shaped pattern. So they'll have one white stripe across the top of their head, two on the sides, and two down here. So when they look straight at me, I'm like, oh, there's that star-shaped pattern. That's how I can identify them. And these, go, these guys go, sit, 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 sit. And my iPhone died on the way here, so otherwise I'd be playing these songs for you, but they died. So my phone died, so uh, hopefully I can get home tonight without my GPS, but um, we'll see. We like see. your calls. I think your calls are pretty good. You think my calls are pretty good? Okay, cool. And um, the last bird I want to mention is the Eastern Meadowlark. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, grassland nesting bird. All three of these species are species of special concern on the Connecticut's um, endangered, threatened, and uh, species of special concern list. And these guys, I can kind of whistle their song. They go. Huh. It sort of sounds like spring of fear, spring of fear. Huh. And oftentimes you'll see them sitting like this on a, a post on the side of a field, uh, you know, singing their song. Well, all three of these birds, what they have in common, if you go to the next slide, is their grass and nesting. They are ground nesting birds. So their nests are, you know, are right on the ground, um, mushed in with the grasses. And we can go to the next slide. 
where you find these grass and birds are areas that are 15 acres or larger, dominated by grasses such as orchard grass, timothy, bluegrass, um, smooth brome. Uh, they also use fields that contain some legumes and other plants, up to 20%. They actually like the fields that contain some legumes. Uh, and uh, they like fields that are located adjacent to pastures. So uh, say there's only maybe 10 acres of a, hay of a hay field, but if it's adjacent to another open area, then the, these birds will sort of perceive that area as being larger than it is. So uh, if there are other open pastures uh, near a particular you know, hay field or field that provides good habitat for these birds, uh, they're, they are, they're more likely to use it. And then also um, fields that contain uh, grass hay that heads later than usual due to damp soil um, and cooler microclimates um, or late maturing varieties are also places that these birds tend to use. Now, I want to kind of go a little bit more in depth into the, the grass and bird biology. Uh, I kind of want to talk about uh, over the course of the, the season in Connecticut, when do these birds arrive? Uh, when do they start nesting? You know, how long do they nest? Uh, and when do they depart and head south again? So our male bobolinks start moving into Connecticut uh, at the end of April. And the females start to arrive a little bit later, so early May. So you can see the difference here between the male and the female. The female is a little bit drabber, but has a nice sort of yellow wash to her. And the last bobolinks will tend to arrive in the second half of May. So um, one strategy for, for farmers that are haying, and I want to just talk about this now because it's a good moment to, is to uh, try to hay early when these birds are just starting to show up um, and then any additional birds that are arriving can kind of come in and set up territory and then have a good amount of time to try to get in a nest before the next round of hay. Uh, so that is one strategy um, that some farmers use to be able to give these birds a, an opportunity to nest. So uh, once the birds arrive, um, and some of them might start nesting in mid-May, some of them might start nesting towards the end of May, uh, they're going to lay their eggs um, and they're going to go through their incubation period. So building the nest takes two or three days, and then uh, the birds lay one egg a day. So uh, if they're going to produce a, a clutch of four or five eggs, it's going to take four or five days for them to, to get a full nest. And uh, then it's 11 to 13 days of incubation. So that total time period from when the birds get there to when they finish incubation is about 21 days. Uh, and then early June, the first nests are going to start to hatch. Um, you know, and these uh, birds are altricial, which basically means that when they're born, they're pretty much naked, they have just a few little feathers, their eyes are closed, they can't feed themselves, they can't really leave the nest. Um, this is a strategy that some birds use to basically reduce the, the length of their incubation time. Uh, and on the other end of things, there's birds that are precocial, like the pipe and clover on the coast, and they have a much longer incubation period, but when their chicks hatch, they're completely mobile and able to feed themselves. So this is a, just one of the strategies that birds use. So if we have birds that are, you know, those earliest birds that arrive in the beginning of May uh, might have their chicks hatching in the beginning of June. And by the end of June, uh, those birds are able to sort of leave the nest. They might need about another week before they're really capable of flight. Uh, but the neat things about these songbirds is they go really grow quickly. Um, you know, it's, um, I think it's something like 12 days. I think it says that if you click it one more time. There we go, eight to 12 days for this little dainty bird to go from that size to being able to sort of flutter around in a field. Uh, I, you know, when I was doing my master's degree research on troubling nesting birds, it was amazing that from one day to the next, you can see a difference in the size and how many feathers these birds have. Um, they really grow extraordinarily fast. Um, you know, it, it, it's a kind of, if our, if our kids were like that, it would be much easier, you know, if uh, <laughs> they, they came out and boom, within a week they were ready to go. <laughs> uh, probably not as much fun though, so. And then, um, so you might have birds that are just about ready to fledge the nest and fly by say the second, first week of July. And then those birds, um, young bird, young from, from later nests, um, might be done at about the end of July. And then, uh, Come August, these birds are heading south again. Uh, these, they do migrate all the way down to South America, and that's where they spend the winter, um, before they come back up north again in April and May. So you can go to the next slide. 
Oh, see, there we go. Yeah. Bobo leaves are no longer in Connecticut and are well into their journey to South America by October. And that's that's the furthest migratory path, right? I don't know. But it's, it's a pretty far it's, one for songbirds. One I think yeah. that there's some terns that uh, fly even farther. Eileen, do you know which bird it is that has the longest migration route? I, I think it's the Arctic tern. The Arctic tern, yeah. 20,000 miles a year. Yes, oh. yeah. So um, that's a bird that goes from the, the Arctic pretty much pretty much to the Antarctic and back again in, in the course of its year. So the challenge with grassland birds is that, you know, I mean, for us to still to have open habitat, like, you know, grasslands, hay fields, uh, for the, the, these birds to use, um, you know, farming actually is a necessity. It's essential. Um, so, you know, by, by farming a field, you're keeping it open. Uh, and that's giving these birds an opportunity to, to use that habitat for nesting. Um, you know, if, if there wasn't any farms in Connecticut, all of our land would just turn back to forest. We would not have any habitat for these birds. So uh, farming is essential to actually provide some habitat for birds like the bobolink and the savannah sparrow in the eastern meadowlark. But the challenges um, when it comes to hay fields is that uh, early haying does reduce the productivity of bobolinks and savannah sparrows and eastern meadowlarks. Um, you know, if you uh, hay a field right in the middle of, of June, there's a pretty good chance that uh, most of the nests are going to fail because those birds are on the ground and they're just not yet able to, to nest successfully. I mean, to, to leave the nest. But I think, um, you know, one thing that, that Audubon strongly believes is that farming and conservation and gra grassland birds can go hand in hand. Uh, there are a lot of things that, that farmers can do and, and birders can help uh, to, to allow for, for some of these grassland bird species to be able to reproduce and produce young. Um, I recognize that, you know, I can't go and say, hey, we, nobody can hay until August because we need these birds to be able to produce young. Um, that's not a reality. Uh, but it's trying to find a place where we can meet in the middle. Um, are there ways that, uh, you know, farmers and, and bird conservationists, you know, can work together and figure out simple ways that, that the birds can produce some young um, and the farmers can still get the hay that they need uh, for their, their livestock and for their, their income. So next slide. And managing for grassland birds has its benefits. Um, studies have shown that grassland birds uh, can reduce populations of potentially harmful insects like caterpillars, weevils, cutworms, beetles, and flies. So having those grassland birds in your, your fields are, are going to benefit your, your hay and your crops. Next slide. So what are some of the strategies that uh, farmers can use to allow for some bird, grass and nesting birds to, to produce young um, and still you know, um, you know, be able to have a productive year uh, for their hay and, and uh, for their livestock? And a lot of it is planning. So assessing your current hay field resources. So where are your hay fields? Um, are, there, are there any that you, you know, typically don't hay until later in the season? Um, you know, evaluating your hay and forage needs uh, to meet current and long-term production goals. So, uh, you know, maybe you just uh, hay for, you know, a, a few horses that you have on the land, and then um, the rest of the hay is maybe just used for bedding. You might be able to uh, sort of decide, you know what, I need to hay this area in June because, you know, this, I need this valuable hay for my horses, but this other area here that's just going to be bedding, I can wait on that area. Uh, identify any excess, excess hay fields, uh, fields that may not be critical for early hay mowing, and fields that are not usually uh, too or that are usually too wet for early mowing. Uh, so it's about looking at the hay fields that, that you're managing, and, and sort of seeing if there's any places where um, you can allow a little bit of that area to, to not be hayed until later in the season. And also look for the birds. Uh, you know, if you, um, I've got some flyers out back there that show pictures of bubble lakes and savanna sparrows and eastern meadowlarks. And uh, I think farmers know their land better than anybody else. And uh, if they can recognize these birds, then they might notice that actually the bubble lakes are just in that little corner over there. So I can hay the whole rest of the field if I just leave that one little area for the bubble lakes over there. Um, or you might, a farmer might pick up on, like, Oh, yep, I've seen the males, and then, hell, oh, hey, there's a fledgling. Okay, they fledged. We can hay the area now. So um, by being observant, 
and sort of seeing what, you know, where, what areas the birds are using and kind of keeping an eye on where they're at in their nesting cycle. Uh, that can help, um, you know, in terms of, you know, let, to let the birds produce some young. Um, and then just over here, I have excess hay acres, mulch and bedding hay harvests, and hay for mature livestock. Um, so hay that does not necessarily need to be the, the most nutrient-rich hay is very compatible um, with grass and bird habitat. So, you know, if there's hay that, you know, you don't need that really high nutrition hay, it can wait a little bit before, before being hay. Um, you know, that, that little bit of weight is enough time to give these grassland birds a chance to reproduce. And then I just want to sort of remind everyone of the timing again. So, you know, these birds begin arriving in late April through May. They begin building and laying eggs um, in the early part of June. Uh, this slide says they're hatching in late June, but some of them might be hatching in earlier June too, but uh, fledging is basically early to mid-July. So, um, you know, the ideal strategy is to, to lay hay until the end of July, but again, I don't necessarily think that that's practical. So it's, you know, where can we find compromise? We can go to the next slide. So, I mean, yeah, delaying hay till you know, August 15th or July 31st, or even July 15th, is really going to give some of these birds an opportunity to produce. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, some one strategy for allowing grass and birds to reproduce is to actually hay early in May, say in the first week of May when the birds are still arriving, um, and then that hay will start to regrow, and the birds that are continuing to arrive will build have territories in that area, and then they're going to have a good length of time before the next hay in order to be, produce their young. I mentioned monitoring birds to determine uh, where they're nesting and when their first brood has fledged. And then also uh, one strategy is to test the hay quality to determine when is the op optimal time to harvest. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of uh, so the it's kind of middle of June is sort of the time that people feel is the, the optimal time to hay, but it, it's worth it, you know, doing some testing to figure out really when is the best time for you to farm to hay your fields in order to um, get the best quality hay for, for livestock. And then even if somebody has to hay, there are still strategies that can be employed that are going to give grass and nesting birds the best shot. Um, one is to use flushing bars that kind of are, are just sort of in front of the, the haying apparatus and that allows any birds that are, have, have fledged or even uh, female birds that are on nests, to, it gives them a little bit of warning to get out of the way. Uh, another possibility is to raise the blades about six inches above the ground, and that will protect some nests um, from getting destroyed during haying practices. And then the last strategy is to hay from the inside of the fields to the outside. So, you know, kind of looking at this field here, uh, if a, a farmer needed to hay this area, which already has been hay, but if they went out to the middle of the field and then sort of worked their way outward, any um, young birds or females that are in this field are gonna have the chance to move out of the field. Versus if you hay from the outside in, um, those birds are just gonna keep moving further and further in and eventually they'll be in the path of the, the hay, the hay and the So I just wanna, you know, again, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, the goal is to try to meet in the middle. Are there ways that, um, you know, farmers can adjust their haying schedules um, or patterns that are going to give some of, these, some of these birds a chance to produce young. Um, you know, we're not necessarily looking for everybody must stop haying by and stop haying until August 15th. I realize that's not practical, but I'm hoping that by providing some suggestions for for how we can conserve grass and birds and still have productive farms, um, that everybody here uh, might be able to consider um, their practices and maybe make some minor adjustments that are going to benefit uh, you know, birds and also still lead, lead to productive farming. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, and I'm glad to take questions, though. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in Peter and Steve.